We did it. I still can't believe we got this project done so fast and so well. When I'm in New York. I'm in Chicago. And I'm in L.A. But we're making it happen in Miro. Together. Our best work just happens faster on Miro's collaborative online whiteboard. No more scheduling meeting after meeting for work that could happen from anywhere. Whether it's getting design feedback here, mapping timelines here, or brainstorming next steps here. It all just happens on the Miro board. Exactly. And it's nice not having to wait an entire day to get sign off from this guy. Hey! Well, it is true. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com. The first three boards are free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 151. Operation Typhoon, Part 2. As November 1941 came to Western Russia, the Germans appraised their situation, both tactical and strategic. The Wehrmacht had achieved what neither Napoleon nor the Second Reich during World War I could. Leningrad was surrounded. To the far south, German troops were at the Crimea. And before Moscow, only some 80 kilometers before Moscow, was the tip of Army Group Center's spear. And yet, it was November. Now was the time of the Rasputista, the heavy rains and prevailing mud. Then would come the winter proper. Already, the invaders' heavy guns and tanks were slowed down. The soldiers could only imagine what the extreme drop in temperatures would bring next. As for the ranking officers and those leading the three army groups, they had received statistics of what had been lost to get this far, the price they had paid, and would have to pay to go further east. Yes, they could assemble what was left and continue on, but as they would be fighting with less, and the Russians seemed more determined than ever to keep them back, the attackers would logically lose more than they already had. By November 1st, 1941, the German army in the east had lost 686,000 men. That was 20% of what they had started with and had been given since June 22nd. That left some 2.7 million men attacking Russia. But as everyone knew, they, the Russians, had more. The Germans also had fewer motor vehicles, by some one-third of what they had started with. And even more amazingly, most panzer divisions were now at 35% of their full strength. This statistic alone gave many German generals pause. The tanks were what had gotten them this far. Supporting those tanks were the now shivering men. Starting out with 136 divisions, by November, if the men were squeezed into full divisions, that number would have gone down to 83. Still an impressive number, but much less so when one considers the size of the country they were trying to conquer. Then there was simply the sheer distance. From Warsaw to Moscow is 1,264 kilometers, or 786 miles. And German logistics were doing everything they could just to bring up enough fuel and ammunition. If they were to delay even for a short time, and focus on things like winter clothing and building materials. The attackers would have to husband their bullets and shells, just when they were about to renew their offensive, which doesn't take into account what they would have to do if counterattacked, and they knew they would be. Repulsing charging Russians had become a way of life for the German soldiers, now much closer to Moscow than their own native soil. It would be Field Marshal von Rundstedt of Army Group South to break first, by requesting that he be allowed to stop for the winter, to hold to what they had, and push on again in 1942. And yet, the Germans, 
though they had lost much to get to this point, had gutted the Soviets' defense, even if they didn't know the exact numbers. By the opening of November, the Red Army was estimated by Berlin to have 160 divisions and a few dozen brigades, all of which were supposedly far below strength. So the Germans were in a good tactical position by the fighting they had engaged in, but it was those very conflicts that left them considerably weakened from when they started. Had the invaders been able to turn back the calendar by two months, yet keep their current positions, it would have boded well for them to take their 2.7 million men and engage the roughly 2.2 million Soviet soldiers now between them and Moscow. But that could not happen. Also, an attacking force hardly ever uses its full complement of troops, as reserves were always needed at some secondary point during the battle. So the number of men were roughly the same on each side, yet that was about to change. Within 30 days, with the reserve forces coming to the fore, the Soviets would have, to defend the capital and the surrounding areas and other cities, a new total of some 4 million men, of 343 divisions and 98 brigades. Of course, the Germans did not know this, and indeed not knowing of the surge of Soviet troops coming out from the east, encouraged them even more. Simply, it came down to this. As Soviet Russia had more men, if the Germans waited until late winter, many thousands of those Russian men could have been somewhat trained, somewhat armed, somewhat organized, but most certainly placed in front of Moscow. No, the time to attack was now, before any more men could be placed in their way. That was Hitler's thinking, and before it got colder, even though several nights already had sunk below zero degrees Fahrenheit. As for the OKH, or Supreme High Command of German Army's chief, Franz Halder, in regards to the Army's next move, he was more cautious. In fact, Halder's cautious ways often put him at odds with his leader. Instead, Halder's thinking was, as the Soviets did not have the manpower to form a continuous line from Lake Ladoga to the Black Sea, they would have to be selective in what they protected that winter. Obviously, on that list would be Moscow, the ports to the north and south, and the Caucasus. The weak point seemed to be just north of Moscow, a vital area of Soviet communications and industry. Halder had his thinking put into writing on November 7th, called Concerning the Continuation of Operations Against the Enemy Grouping Between the Volga and Lake Ladoga, his title said it all, Halder planned on taking and controlling the area to the north of Moscow, to the Volga River, which would allow the Germans to simultaneously truly cut off Leningrad, threaten Moscow, and cut off the ports to the north. What it would not do was win the war. A week later, on November 13th, Halder gathered with the OKH staff officers and the three army groups chief of staff to discuss his paper. But when going over the latest intelligence reports, Halder the cautious found that the Wehrmacht's tactical situation was even worse than what he thought. By this new standard, even his plan was considered beyond reality. So it was shifted down to just spending the rest of 1941 keeping Leningrad encircled and only threatening the capital. Nothing more. But then in stepped Hitler, who seemed to be using his intuition again, rather than facts or figures. And this sixth sense of his had served him well in sizing up the cautious foreign nation-states before hostilities broke out. But, as touching Stalin's Russia, with hindsight, it's now possible to say, with some certainty, that Hitler was not gauging the winds of fortune, but rather simply focused on his hatred of Bolshevism and Stalin. He further justified his more exciting and daring attack plan by saying 
This direct action against the enemy would not only bring the beginning of the end of the war, but would also lift the spirits of his soldiers. Field commanders had reported back to Berlin that morale was slipping as the casualty lists lengthened and the thermostat lowered. Unilaterally, the Fuhrer believed he had decided the fate of Moscow. The truth was, he had just decided the fate of Army Group Center. Field Marshal Feder von Bock of Army Group Center was ordered to take Moscow. This Hitler had decided and shared with a few intimates at the end of October, but not his chief of staff, making all of Halda's work a waste of time. But you can do that when you're the Fuhrer. Believing he was taking into consideration the changing weather, Hitler wanted the attack, the last attack to be needed on Moscow, to start no later than November 15th. That was when, hopefully, the panzer halting mud would be frozen. And he was right. In fact, he was more right than he would want to be. Just days before his deadline to commence the attack on the capital, the temperature fell to minus eight degrees, and it was about to get much worse. The capture of Moscow would unfold like this. Hitler wanted two mobile groups to hit the Soviet Western Front on its far flanks, to the north and south of the capital. As had been the German modus operandi, the two forces would swing wide of Moscow and meet up about 60 miles, or 96 kilometers, east of the city, near Orenkova Zovia. Reinhardt's 3rd Panzer Group, supported by Strauss's Ninth Army, would swing north, come through Klin, and cross the Volga-Moscow Canal. Meanwhile, Guderian's 2nd Army, Panzers and Infantry, would start from the south and travel through Tula and Kashira. This left Hopner's 4th Panzer Group and Kluge's 4th Army to, as before, head directly east, right at the capital, on the main road, thus providing the linchpin for the two wings. This was sound, if not an obvious, strategy. The Stavka certainly saw this coming. Soon the mud would freeze and the Panzers would, once again, be on the move. But more than just Moscow did the Soviet leadership fear to lose that late winter. Leningrad was still on the edge. Stalingrad, 500 miles or 804 kilometers to the southeast of Moscow, was also being threatened by Army Group South. 100 miles or 160 kilometers northeast of the capital was Rostov, and that, like the others, was at the very least threatened with encirclement and isolation. If any or most of these possibilities came true, then the loss of soldiers, manufacturing, transportation centers could spell the end of any practicable Soviet resistance. This was especially true as the dismantled factories taken from the West had yet to be reconstructed to any great degree. So Stalin found himself having to choose which areas he really wanted to defend while he launched whatever counterattacks he could. Yet his limited, for now, manpower truly meant not attacking too much in order to not weaken his defenses. Or at least, it should have. As the Stavka believed that the Germans would come at the capital from Volokolamsk to the north by some 60 miles, or 96 kilometers, northwest of Moscow, and from the south through Serpukov, some 80 miles, or 128 kilometers, to the southwest, the 16th, 5th, 33rd, 43rd, 49th, and 50th armies were taken from Zhukov's western front and put in a line just north of Volokolamsk to Tula, itself south of Serpukov. This was Stalin over-engineering his defensive line, but the thought or hope, rather, was that this extended line, some 450 miles or 720 kilometers long, from beyond the probable attack points, would hold up the two flanking attacks, as well as the direct threat coming from due west. 
But Stalin knew, as did the Stavka, that this one line would not hold back the Germans. None of the other lines had. So, to increase his chances of success, the 22nd, 29th, 31st, and 30th armies, these coming from Konev's Kalinin front, would engage the Germans coming from the north. While Timoshenko's southwestern front's 3rd and 13th armies were assigned the task of hindering Guderian to the south, as he was sure to make his way to the northeast. Stalin's idea was to strike first, hopefully delaying the German attack, possibly to the point that the deep snows would come before the Germans set out. But even this was not seen as enough, little wonder, so more units were called in to help with the defense of Moscow and the other major cities, soon to be under attack. From the far east, Siberia and Russian Central Asia, armies came, including other hinterland units. Together, they would form nine reserve armies, sure to be needed soon. On paper, they would form 59 rifle and 13 cavalry divisions, and 75 rifle and 20 tank brigades. But even this was not seen as enough. After all, even though the entity that was Soviet Russia could survive without Moscow and the other large cities, their loss would walk and talk like defeat, so would be perceived to be defeat. No, the line had to be drawn here. The Soviet forces must hold here, or all was lost. The Germans, when they discovered another defensive line before them, they realized they had to win here, or break themselves. But even then, Stalin wasn't finished with his defenses of his capital. From the People's Militia, some 65,000 additional troops would be placed in Moscow itself. As for the regular army troops not counting Stalin's new defensive line, they would form three defensive rings around the city. The furthest one, some 30 kilometers or 18 miles outside town. The second, within the city's suburbs. And the last, a belt of troops mostly to the east of the city. The militia, meanwhile, constructed and manned various barricades and strong points. But as fast as the Russian soldiers and citizens moved, and indeed they did, it still wasn't enough for Stalin. He ordered Zhukov to personally begin counterattacks. The general replied that, one, it wouldn't do any good, as not enough men could be detached from the defensive lines to make a real difference, and two, when those units were defeated, as surely they would be, it would leave the city's defenses that much weaker. To wit, the Soviet premier probably showed the general an organizational chart of the Communist Party and pointed at the name at the apex. Shrugging his shoulders, Zhukov proceeded to attack. First, Zakharkin's 49th and 50th armies were ordered to attack Guderian's spearheads north and south of Tula in the southern area. They commenced the assault on November 8th, and were soon in a running battle. The attack didn't work out as well as Stalin wanted, but it did delay the German right wing's attack. What's more, there was a moment during the fighting, on November 17th, when the Germans got a glimpse into the future. The German 112th Infantry Division found itself being engaged by T-34 tanks, and realized, almost too late, that their anti-tank weapons weren't getting the job done. The 112th did something that shook OKH Chief Halder to his core. They panicked and ran away. It took a couple days, but then the 167th Infantry Division arrived and used their more powerful artillery to chase away the T-34s. But the Germans were now on notice. Only their heavier guns had any chance against the larger Soviet tanks. Just days after this attack had started, on November 11th, the Soviet 238th Rifle Division and the 258th Rifle and 31st Cavalry Divisions attacked the German 31st 
and 113th Infantry Divisions that were attempting to encircle Tula, again to the south. The battle there raged for five days, and Zukov sent in the 194th Rifle Division to assist, probably surprised that the original counterattacking forces were still alive. Together, they stopped the Germans from surrounding Tula, but could not push them back. On November 14th, to the south, Zakharkin had some of his infantry divisions attack near Serpukov, one of the towns that the Germans would surely go through on their way to Moscow, and there was some minimal penetration. But as the Germans were themselves getting ready to attack, were in good defensive positions and the next day they were able to stabilize the front to its previous alignment. Not letting the Germans to the northeast of Moscow have been any easier, Zhukov then ordered Rokossovsky's 16th Army to attack just north of Volokolomsk, while the 49th Army attacked just south of it. Rokossovsky launched his attack on November 16th, and at least he had the sense to hit where the two different units joined, hoping to create confusion as to which one should counterattack. The Russians pushed the German panzer and infantry units away, who were themselves getting ready to attack, by some four kilometers, or 2.4 miles. Yet they were suffering disproportionate numbers for such a trifle victory. Then Rokossovsky sent in Major General Devator's 20th and 44th Cavalry Divisions. But the inexperienced Mongolian Cavalry Division, the 44th, crossed an open field to get at the Germans. They never made contact, as 2,000 of them fell to machine gun fire and artillery shells. The Germans lost not a man. What was left of Rokossovsky's command was ordered to pull back the next day, November 17th. Zhukov was proven right. The Soviets lost more men than they killed, and the Germans were still, more or less, at their jump-off points. But this series of disruptive attacks did unnerve some of the German high command. It was clear to Halder now that the Russians would fight for every single kilometer. If the Germans wanted more Russian territory, they would have to fight for it as well. Around November 17th, Halder committed to his diary that the die was cast. They had to attack now, before the deep snows were upon them. And yet, if they waited, they could concentrate more forces and choose the best places to attack. Whereas the Soviets had to guard everywhere. But... It was too late for that, per the calendar and Hitler. Okay, ready? Ready? You're supposed to say something. Okay, I'll take that. Okay, I'll take that. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So now it's time to draw for the giveaway of the Winter Winston set shaving kit from Harry's. So for everybody who entered, thank you very much for that. So as always, I have my family here. Sophie's very excited to draw her name. I have my family here to help. So what we're going to do is we'll draw, each of us will draw a name. So there'll be four names, and then we'll pair it down to two. Then we will have our winner, okay? So who wants to go first? Sophie, all right? Again, remember this is an, um, you know, audio, so you have to say something, okay? Hi. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sophie has drawn Guy Mummings. So, Guy, you're in the running. Kiki. Mm. Don't look. Just, there you go. All right, the next person is Richard Booth. So, congratulations, Richard, honey. Yes. Oh, she's mixing up good. She's very fair. All right. Alex Atterbury. All right. So one more for me. I put my name in here. So hopefully, anyway. Um, oh, that's there. Okay. Neil Harrington. All right. So we have our four people. So now we get to, I'm not cleaning up that mess. Okay. So now we just need to pair down to two people. So, so, no, leave this. Sophie, you draw a name. Don't look. Draw a name. All right. So the two runner-ups. 
or two, whatever. I don't know what it's called. I'm not in Miss Universe. Uh, Richard Booth is one. Okay, Kiki, don't look. Don't look. All right. Guy Mummings. Okay, so we have our two finalists for that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, like in the Miss Universe contest, is draw the uh, runner-up. Who was the equivalent of the fa my father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate? You get absolutely nothing, but thank you very much for playing. So let's see here. The runner-up who gets nothing is... Sorry, Guy. Okay, Guy. Mummings, you were the runner-up. Congratulations. You're in second place. That's not bad. So the winner of the... Winter Winston's set is uh, Richard Booth. So Richard Booth, when you hear this, just send me an email to wwiipodcast at gmail.com. And if I'll wait six months, and if you don't, then I'll email you. But congratulations, you're the winner. So I will see everybody in about a week with the next episode. Thank, Yay. thank you. Yay. That, that was good. So thank you for listening, and thank you for those who participated. And you'll hear from us soon.